Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of life? Hello everyone. Welcome to the Mana Plus Gaming Channel, once again it's me, your host and channel owner. In previous videos, I provided you with analyses, evaluations, and my hypotheses about the lore of the DLC based on my perspective of what happened in the three-minute trailer of Shadow of the Erd Tree. Regarding the relative position of the Land of Shadow compared to the Lands Between, as well as exploring the reasons why the Land of Shadow was subjected to a purge in a conflict known as the Unsung Battle. As I presented in previous video segments, it seems that the Unsung Battle occurred between the Omen and the Golden Order, primarily stemming from political and religious disagreements as well as the Golden Order's desire to increase and impose its influence on the Lands of the Lands Between. While the defeated side has been named, what about the victorious ones? Because their fate, we've already learned in the original game. So, what about Mesmer? The leader of the Omen faction, all we need to know about him will be revealed in this video. Of course, all analysis and hypotheses I provide are purely personal viewpoints, supported by the vague resemblance between small details appearing in the trailer and a bit of logical reasoning. Please join me in watching this video. Mother. 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 Yes, I'm sorry for letting him say mother three times. And this is the first scene of the trailer that opens up to us a new character named Mesmer. I think I should start analyzing from this scene because even though short, it provides us with almost 100% confirmation that Mesmer is indeed the son of Queen Marika. This has also been confirmed by the game's director, Mr. Miyazaki, so there's no debate here. And of course, the mother he refers to is Queen Marika. But perhaps there's more to it. What particularly caught my attention is when he mentions, mother, his arm swings forward. Theoretically, when you edit a video or make a film, you obviously want the visuals and sound to align perfectly, as they are complementary elements that make your scene meaningful. This trickery is also certainly applied in this trailer, and therefore when Mesmer swings his arm up along with the image of a bracer on his wrist as the focal point of the scene and says mother, it's hard to doubt that there's a strong connection between that bracer and the mother he mentions. There are two hypotheses here that I think are most plausible. The first is that, the bracer is a relic left by Queen Marika for him and he cherishes it. The second is that, this bracer could be evidence of sins or representative of a certain ideology that makes him opposed to the Golden Order, which in the past, he clearly was a part of. Here, I lean towards the second hypothesis, but why is that? First and foremost, we need to consider the pattern appearing on the surface of this bracer. I've compared its design with nearly 100% of the items already present in the original game, and it seems not to match any pattern that has appeared in the original game. Honestly speaking, I'm not sure if this pattern is a depiction of fire, clouds, mist, or water, but upon closer inspection, it seems more akin to a depiction of fire. You can see it bears some resemblance to the pattern on Malaketha's sword. Furthermore, this bracer is completely different in style from the bracer worn by the woman in the painting on the wrist. However, the pattern on Mesmer's bracer seems to be the closest or similar to the pattern on the armor of the omen. If you pay attention, the patterns on the omen's armor could very well be a stylized form of a deteriorating malediction, and this pattern is arguably the most common pattern of the crucible. You can find this pattern on many items or creatures related to the crucible. Next, I'll consider his behavior in this scene. When he mentions, mother, it coincides with the creation and release of flame ashes from his palm in a hostile manner. This directly reinforces my belief that it's highly likely that he and his mother are antagonistic towards each other. As we know, the hypothesis I put forward in previous videos is that the Land of Shadow is a giant prison and Mesmer led the faction of the Omen against the Golden Order in the Unsung Battle, so it's entirely plausible that Mesmer and Queen Marika are at odds with each other. It's also worth mentioning that in the trailer, there are numerous scenes featuring the appearance of bracers on the wrists of various characters, monsters, and so on. 
Therefore, we can believe that the culture of wearing bracers on the wrists is quite prevalent in the land of shadow, similar to the culture of wearing masks in the lands between that we've witnessed in the original game. Moreover, it's highly possible that this culture of wearing bracers even belongs to some kind of religion or belief system that was once prevalent in the land of shadow, and this may play some significant role in the storyline of the DLC, because it's clear that it's not a coincidence that From Software favored their appearance multiple times in their trailer like that. Now, I'll take a moment to talk about the woman appearing in this painting, whom I'm quite confident they are that the Erdtree faithful that the NPC mentioned in the trailer. She stands next to another older man, who seems quite elderly wearing a yellow traveler's cloak. The woman herself also wears a different cloak that seems to be of the traveler's type. Therefore, I believe that the two people in this painting are both from a different place who came to the Land of Shadow. If any of you have played Sekiro and are familiar with the return ending of that game, you might also think that this painting is an Easter egg of Sekiro, where the old man in the painting is Sekiro and the pregnant girl in the painting is also the divine child. In that ending, both of them set out to the west, so where they went? Is it the Land of Shadow? Returning to the main topic, as we know, the Land of Shadow is the land where Queen Marika first set foot, and of course, like most of you, we all believe that the woman in the painting is Queen Marika before she became a goddess. And therefore, her hair is still black instead of the golden hair, which is a representation of Elden Ring or the Golden Order. What's special is that she is pregnant, and the child in her belly is most likely Mesmer, Marika's eldest child. So, in terms of the hypothesis, I believe that before Marika came to the Land of Shadow, she was already pregnant, and of course, Mesmer cannot be the child of Godfrey or Radagon. Even if we don't know who Mesmer's biological father is, this is not unreasonable because I recall correctly that it's highly likely that Nephili Lu is also Godfrey's daughter and we also don't know who her mother is. As for the man in the painting, personally, I believe he is a close servant of Marika, also a Newman, and came to the Land of Shadow with Marika. Moreover, it's very likely that he played some important role in Marika's process of becoming a goddess later, leading to him being punished by the Omen or those who worship the Omen, which I'll talk more about him later. As for the bracer she uses, although its design doesn't resemble Mesmer's bracer, as I mentioned earlier, when Mesmer mentions mother and extends his hand forward with his bracer, this clearly reinforces the hypothesis that the woman in the painting is his mother and is Queen Marika when she was not yet a goddess or discovered the Elden Ring or Greater Will and was just a completely normal person, newly arrived in the lands between with a mischievous, sinister smile. Mother. Wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of life? As for Mesmer's line in this excerpt, Mother, wouldst thou truly lordship sanction in one so bereft of light, it's clearly a question with multiple layers of meaning. In the first sense, Mesmer is clearly showing doubt and feeling unjust that Queen Marika would trust and support the authority to someone lacking in grace, namely the tarnished, us players. And the next scene you've also witnessed in the trailer is that he summons his demonic flame and rushes towards the advertising friend in a hostile manner. Personally, I support this first interpretation. It's very possible that he's mocking us players before attacking us in a scene before the start of the boss fight. In the second sense, it's broader. He seems to be questioning himself about the issues Queen Marika is facing frankly asking if Queen Marika truly accepts the punishment of the Lordship in a place lacking light like this? In this sense, it seems that Mesmer has realized the absence or disappearance of Queen Marika is because she has been punished by Radagon or the Elden Beast within the Erdtree. This doesn't seem to contradict his question as Radagon himself is a Lordship and within the body of the Erdtree, it's also a place lacking light as we know. Of course, for the second interpretation to be correct and reasonable, it requires Mesmer to have a thorough understanding of the important information of the lands between, especially the disappearance of Queen Marika after the shattering event. This is not really feasible because he is an exiled and imprisoned person in the Land of Shadow, a place physically separated from the lands between, so it seems that his question regarding the first interpretation is more reasonable. He is mocking and doubting Queen Marika's decision to empower the tarnished. Of course, these are just my speculations, especially since my English grammar proficiency is limited, 
so if anyone has a different answer or thoughts about Mesmer's line, please leave them in the comments below. Now, let's move on to the next excerpt. In this excerpt, we can clearly see his overall appearance. Regarding the design, I can give him 100 points immediately. Moreover, it seems that From Software has borrowed some aesthetic elements from a character in the famous Berserk manga series by Kentaro Miura. Overall, he looks exactly like a Greek god, possibly the god of war, Ares, but I won't delve too much into his appearance. What's important is that there are many symbols on his body believed to be heretical and opposing the Erdtree and Greater Will, which I'll analyze further later. Firstly, let's pay attention to the statue behind him, which I'm quite certain is Queen Marika. I'll brighten the image a bit for us to have a clearer view. You can clearly see Marika's braided hair, belt, and the silk strips on her clothes. I believe at this point, Marika has been chosen by Greater Will, becoming a goddess and the vessel of the Elden Ring. Particularly, the statue depicts Marika carrying a child, whom I'm 99% sure is Mesmer. Thus, according to my deduction, Mesmer was born after Marika became a goddess, directly explaining why he possesses immense power, inherited from Marika, rather than being a normal person if he were born before Marika became a goddess. It's also worth mentioning that the statue of Marika carrying Mesmer bears a striking resemblance to the design of abductor virgins in the original game. However, I completely dismiss the hypothesis that Mesmer was abducted in the past or is related to these relatively similar killing machines. These killing machines are simply a product, perhaps belonging to Volcano Manor, if I recall correctly, and were used to fight against the soldiers of Landel Capital. However, this slight resemblance could lead to another hypothesis that Queen Marika was pregnant with Mesmer while still a virgin. This is not entirely unreasonable because at this point, we have no way of knowing who Mesmer's father is. If Mesmer is Radagon's son, it would contradict the hypothesis that Mesmer participated in the battle against the giants before Radagon became the king consort. And it also contradicts the hypothesis about the dark-haired pregnant woman I mentioned earlier. Therefore, honestly, who Mesmer's father is doesn't really matter, what matters is that we know he is Queen Marika's son, which seems sufficient. But why does Mesmer have a statue of Marika in his room? Does he worship his mother? Personally, I don't think so. In another image provided by the publisher, we see him sitting on a chair similar to those of the demigods that appeared in the original game, which directly confirms that he also has a similar position. But everything seems to be just appearances. In my opinion, Mesmer is arrogant with a mischievous smile similar to Queen Marika in the painting, and he likely resembles a model capable of turning good girls into bad ones. Him sitting on the demigod's chair and having a statue of Marika in his room doesn't entirely confirm that he worships or supports her. Everything he displays, from gestures to words, seems to imply that he is mocking his own noble lineage, mocking his own grim fate. Now, I'll talk about the elements on his body in this excerpt, especially the three most important ones, the serpent, the spear, and his flames. First, let's discuss his serpent. Honestly, I'm not sure if he owns a serpent with two heads on each side of the remaining tail or if he has two separate serpents. At first glance, they look quite cute. But in reality, this serpent raises many questions. First, wings sprout from its body like dragon wings, which is undeniable. But why is that? Personally, I believe this serpent is also a product of the crucible. We've seen human-faced lion, tail people, winged beings, horned creatures, walking flowers, and even trees growing out of hippos. It seems that all forms of life will merge in a chaotic state after exposure to the crucible. Therefore, it's highly likely that this serpent is also a creature that has come into contact with the crucible, explaining why its body sprouts wings. Furthermore, this serpent is clearly different from the winged serpent statue at Volcano Manor. As we know, in the age of the Erdtree, the serpent's image was despised and reviled because the snake was viewed as a traitor to the Erdtree. The description of the duelist helm item reads, bronze helm decorated with innumerable snakes, worn by gladiators who were driven from the Colosseum. The wearer becomes a slightly easier target for foes. The snake is viewed as a traitor to the Erdtree, 
and the audience delighted in seeing these bronze effigies beaten and battered. Few could argue for a different fate for the serpent's image in this case. But why is it considered treachery? I previously analyzed the roles of duelists and the events of the unsung battle in a previous video. If you haven't watched it, I'll leave the link below this video's description. In summary, my hypothesis is that Mesmer and his army, who worship the omen, once burned the Ur tree, either before or during the unsung battle. This is not contradictory to any game progress or any other hypotheses the game presents to us. Not only that, it directly explains why the serpent's image is considered a traitor to the Ur tree. If you remember, at Roundtable Hold, finger reader Enia once said to us, the burning of the Ur tree is the first cardinal sin. Therefore, I understand that only severe offenses against the Erd Tree or going against the tenets of Greater Will would cause Mesmer and his Land of Shadow to be cast into the sky and become prisoners in such a powerful punishment. But that's not all, remember that Mesmer's flames are capable of taking away the lives of others, both physically and spiritually, and granting them true death. His flames might be related to the god-slaying black flames of the Rune of Death held by Malakath. After defeating Malakath and releasing the Rune of Death, the giant's flames can now destroy the sharp thorns blocking the entrance to the Erd Tree's trunk. Therefore, I believe that Mesmer's flames may have similar capabilities, at least in terms of damaging the Erd Tree, like the flames of the giants. One last thing about the serpent that I want to mention before moving on is the depraved Perfuma Robe item. This is a very interesting item because it features a red serpent embroidered on the apron of the robe, seemingly sticking its tongue out. Of course, a garment with a forbidden theme during the age of the Erd tree is quite peculiar. This item has the following note, robe worn by depraved perfumers. The embroidery on the apron is itself a curse upon the Erd tree. These heresy-inclined perfumers imbibe their own spices to alter body and mind. Their slow descent into self-destruction is what earned them their name. And everything wouldn't be worth mentioning if you didn't care much about its pattern. But this time, let's take a closer look at the embroidery on this apron, precisely the embroidered red serpent. Yes, I think I'm not mistaken, this is the mysterious pattern representing the crucible that I've mentioned a lot, not only in the beginning of this video, but also in my other videos. A pattern considered a curse during the age of the Erd tree. A pattern that appears frequently on the bodies and objects related to the crucible. Therefore, I can conclude that Mesmer's serpent is highly likely also a product of the crucible, and here I believe that this serpent has come into contact with the crucible, a case similar to the misbegotten. It's also worth mentioning that I believe the crucible is not just an abstract concept symbolizing the chaotic blending of creation, but it likely also exists in a tangible form, possibly in a liquid or solid form similar to tree resin, a substance similar to Elden Ring. If you recall from the Elden Ring trailer released many years ago, there was a scene where Queen Marika used a hammer to shatter Elden Ring and directly caused the shattering event. It's clear that Elden Ring once existed in a tangible form, and according to that trailer, it's very likely that the substance was a type of tree resin, amber, or similar, and it might even be the material that formed the symbol that hanging bodies of Queen Marika and the spear piercing through her abdomen. In conclusion, the crucible or Elden Ring is not just concepts and laws of life, they also exist in some tangible form, similar to tree resin or amber. I have no doubt that the giant tree in the DLC is the crucible tree, and the tower beneath that tree is likely harvesting resin from that giant tree, but for what purpose? Please continue watching the video to find out what they are harvesting it for. If you find this interesting, please subscribe, like, or share it with your friends. Your feedback and contributions are valuable to me, so please leave a comment below to discuss further. There are many questions I haven't been able to answer yet, but I believe you are the ones with the answers, or if possible, please suggest to me. Once again, thank you very much for your support. Now, let's delve into further analysis of Mesmer. In this scene, what impresses me the most is his spear. This is also one of the beautifully designed weapons created by the game developers. Overall, it is divided into two distinct parts, the spearhead and the shaft, along with decorative patterns. In terms of appearance, it's hard to deny the striking resemblance of this spear to Mog, Lord of Blood's weapon. 
They look incredibly similar, especially in the spearhead part, where we can see the similarity in the black color and the flame-like decorative patterns. Of course, apart from these similarities in design, there exist irreconcilable contradictions between Mesmer and Mog. First of all, Mog's flame is a fire born from the blood from another world, possibly bestowed upon Mog by the formless mother, or more accurately, that flame is the blood flame. So, Mog's blood flame can be considered completely different from Mesmer's flame, as Mesmer's flame seems to have the ability to strip away the life of others, both physically and spiritually, and bestow upon its enemies a true death. In one scene of the trailer, we are almost certainly confirmed this when Mesmer said, those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death. In the embrace of Mesmer's flame. As we know, at this point in the timeline, the rune of death is still sealed within Malaketha's body, and therefore, almost no creature can truly die. So, when Mesmer said that, it means he was implying that his flame surely has the ability to take away the lives of creatures. Thus, Mesmer's flame likely contains the power of the rune of death. This is not entirely unfounded, considering the design, Mesmer's spear also shares some similarities with Malaketha's black blade, the black gem on both weapons, and the spearhead being black or the metallic parts of the two weapons also look quite similar. Furthermore, Mesmer's flame also has black smoke parts that resemble the characteristic black smoke of the Rune of Death, and Mesmer's use of flame that is related to the flame of the Rune of Death directly supports the hypothesis that Mesmer is the one who burned the Erd Tree in the past, as his flame seems to have the ability to damage the Erd Tree. As for his eyes, both of them are very special. First, I'll talk about his right eye. It has a golden iris, and the pupil is a black slit, a sign that he possesses the dragon communion eye. As we know, when we defeat dragons and consume their hearts to obtain incantations, at some point, our character's eyes will also transform to become similar to Mesmer's eye. This, to me, is not surprising, considering that Mesmer was the leader of a group of omen worshippers who fought against the Golden Order in the Unsung Battle, a battle that I believe certainly involved dragons from the Golden Order's side. Furthermore, Dragon Communion has long been classified by the Golden Order as heresy and opposed to the Erd Tree, so Mesmer owning the Eye of Dragon Communion likely means he also slayed dragons in the Unsung Battle and is obviously an opponent of the Golden Order. Moreover, Dragon Communion likely plays an important role for Mesmer, and I believe he is likely a supporter of the Dragon Communion heresy. The most obvious evidence is the symbol of Dragon Communion on his logo, and now might be the appropriate time for me to briefly discuss his logo. You can see this logo clearly on the promotional artwork for the collector's edition of the game released by the publisher. From this logo, you can see the symbol of Dragon Communion, and it's hard to mistake it for any other symbols. In addition, on this logo, we also see patterns of fire, snake motifs, a symbol resembling a spear piercing through a circle, and finally, a crown symbol. Perhaps, it's the crown symbol made from the double helix that confuses me the most, because honestly, this symbol appears in many places, or appears on many items provided by the original game. However, you should know that most of the items in the original game decorated with this double helix crown symbol belong to the common folk or low-ranking soldiers, the weak. For example, Brave's Cord Circlet, Commoner's Headband, Hallet Tree Helm, or Sacred Crown Helm. In conclusion, the appearance of this crown symbol on Mesmer's logo tells us that Mesmer may be a person who stands with the weak, the meek, and the downtrodden in society, protecting them and giving them opportunities. Furthermore, this is also one of the very valuable commonalities between Mesmer and Miquela. The item Sacred Crown Helm has the following note, flanged iron cap adorned with a crown of unalloyed gold. Increases faith. Worn by foot soldiers sworn to the hallig tree. Who is it that Miquela shall bless, if not the low, and the meek? From these notes, it's clear that Miquela also stands with the weak in society, similar to Mesmer. However, I completely reject the hypothesis that Miquela and Mesmer are the same person because when Mesmer was fighting in the war with the giants, Miquela was just a child or perhaps not even born yet. Now, let's talk about his closed left eye. Basically, in the original game, we've seen many characters with their left eye closed. Examples include Runny, Melina, Malnia, 
and even Queen Marika, and so on. In most cases, only Molina's eye has been seen open if you pursue the Lord of Frenzied Flame ending. However, there are also other instances where we've received their eyes, like Queen Marika and Radagon, known in the form of talismans, or Malaketha's eye, which he gives us when we start Garenk's questline, or the grapes we give to the blind maiden. However, so far, our understanding of the closed eye has been limited to basic speculation, what we know about it is relatively scarce. It's also worth mentioning that the vast majority of cases where characters have a closed eye are somehow related to a curse or outer god. So, could Mesmer be related to some outer god? I honestly don't know, but I believe that Mesmer's closed eye is likely not a significant issue. His case may be similar to Runny's, she also has a closed eye, but everything we know about it is limited, and Runny's closed eye doesn't play any role in the original game except for shaping her character. As for Mesmer's hair, he also has red hair similar to Radagon, and it's evident that there's a hypothesis suggesting Mesmer is Radagon's child, because, as we know from the original game, Radagon's offspring all have red hair, such as Runny, Radon, or Malnia. Firstly, we need to know that the reason Radagon has red hair is that after the war with the giants, Radagon was cursed to have red hair. Because of this, I directly refute the hypothesis that Mesmer is Radagon's son, because if he were Radagon's child, he probably couldn't participate in the war with the giants, and would have little chance to be involved in the subsequent event, the Unsung Battle. So, where does Mesmer's red hair come from? Certainly, in the world of Elden Ring, it's not uncommon for characters to have red hair even if they're not Radagon's children. Besides the giants, the most famous example is the Misbegotten, they also have red hair or red fur on their bodies. The Misbegotten are creatures that can be considered closely related to the Crucible. The item-winged Misbegotten Ashes has the following note, Ashen remains in which spirits yet dwell. Used to summon the spirit of a winged Misbegotten, a spirit with the aspect of wings, which takes flight to loose arrows, from its bow. The misbegotten are held to be a punishment for making contact with the crucible, and from birth they are treated as slaves, or worse. From this note, we can be sure that the misbegotten are individuals or creatures who have directly contacted the crucible. This explains why they have features of other species such as hair, wings, or tails, and very likely red hair, or red fur. But that's not all, what really made me surprised after watching the Shadow of the Erdtree trailer is that I seem to have seen the misbegotten in their human form, or more precisely, their souls. You can see them in this excerpt, this black shadow is likely a misbegotten before contacting the crucible and undergoing a body transformation into a beast form. With the characteristic item Iron Cleaver along with shackles on their wrists, ankles, and even neck, if I'm not mistaken. The item Iron Cleaver has the following note, fairly large iron cleaver, commonly used by the maltreated misbegotten. Steeped in resentment, these weapons are swung wildly and relentlessly, often after rushing up to foes. From this item, we can know that the misbegotten are combative and bloodthirsty creatures similar to the omen in the Landel capital underground. But why would a creature with such a bizarre appearance have a soul that looks completely human? The explanation for this can only be that the misbegotten were originally ordinary humans, and for some reason, they came into contact with the crucible and underwent a transformation, or more accurately, a mutation. They may have been injected or ingested serum from the crucible to transform their bodies into a more aggressive and bloodthirsty misbegotten race. This hypothesis is entirely plausible, especially since the tower beneath the dying giant tree is still actively harvesting its sap which is likely the crucible. But why would the misbegotten undergo a body transformation by contacting the crucible? I believe that they were originally prisoners, criminals, or slaves. This directly explains the shackles on their bodies, and they underwent some form of punishment under some law in the land of shadow, and then they were reused like slaves to serve noble families, similar to the case of Castle Morn. It's also worth mentioning that someone found the file of the misbegotten in the Elden Ring game installation section called Radagon's Children, but I believe this is not enough to prove that they are Radagon's offspring. It could simply be a humorous or mocking way for the game developers to name the file. 
where Radagon's children could be the term given by the people in the lands between to the misbegotten with the implication of scornfully mocking Radagon for giving birth to inferior monsters or because they have red hair or fur like Radagon. So, how does all this relate to Mesmer? Of course, I believe that Mesmer also had contact with the crucible like the misbegotten, directly explaining why his hair is red like the misbegotten or Radagon's. The hypothesis that Mesmer is someone who has had contact with the crucible is entirely plausible, especially considering his body proportions, which are quite abnormal and unlike those of any normal person. In the original game, we witnessed the physique of Radagon or Marika, whose body proportions were incredibly balanced and perfect, unlike Mesmer's case. Another case of a demigod with abnormal body proportions is Morgoth the Omen King, you can see that his body looks very unusual. Of course, he's an omen, so his body mutation isn't surprising. If we compare Morgoth's body to Mesmer's, there's a bit of coincidence in that their heads are much smaller than their bodies, and their arms and legs are longer than normal, indicating an imbalance in body proportions. In the promotional image of the Collector's Edition, we can clearly see Mesmer's physique on his figure. In general, his arms and legs are very thin but long, accompanied by a pale complexion. I feel like he's a hybrid mutation between a snake and a human, similar to Rhea, who is believed to be the daughter of Rikard and also has a mutated body. In conclusion, I believe that Mesmer may have had a balanced body of a normal person at birth and during his upbringing, but only until he came into contact with the Crucible, similar to the Misbegotten and the Crucible caused a mutation in his body. In the original game, after defeating Morgoth the Omen King, it seems that his body returned to normal like a regular person, his horns, tail, and fur on his body disappeared completely. Perhaps the curse of the crucible can only affect living creatures, and after those creatures die, they will revert to their normal human bodies. This could very well be true, because it directly explains the case of the souls of the misbegotten having the appearance of a normal human. So what will happen if we defeat Mesmer? Will his body undergo another transformation to return to the shape of a normal person, similar to Morgoth's case? This may have to wait until the DLC is released. Now, let's return to the symbols associated with Mesmer. Earlier, I analyzed his logo, which you can clearly see in the promotional image for the Collector's Edition. But did you know that this logo appears in many places in the trailer as well? Firstly, it appears on Mesmer's banners in the scene where his advertising friend uses kung fu moves to kick a soldier, whom I'm quite sure is one of Mesmer's troops. The setting for this scene is likely within a castle with Roman architecture next to the killing fields, as I mentioned in part 1 of this video series. Additionally, this logo also appears in Mesmer's boss room. However, in this scene, I hardly paid attention to the logo. Instead, I focused on another pattern that also appears in Mesmer's boss room, which you can see here. The special thing about this decorative pattern is that it also appears in Queen Marika's bedroom or in Morgoth's boss room, or anywhere in Landal capital. Moreover, if I'm not mistaken, some houses in Landal capital, and only in Landal, have this pattern on their walls, and there are no signs of sealing wax or any resin on the doors of these houses. If any of you are currently traveling in Landal Capital, please check for me. If what I said is not correct, then I may have made a slight mistake, and if so, please leave a comment below to let me know I was wrong. But why is that? Could it be that when attacking Landal Capital, Mesmer's army overlooked houses with this decorative pattern on the walls? Personally, I believe that this decorative pattern belongs to architectural structures or noble families in the capital. In conclusion, the appearance of this decorative pattern in Mesmer's boss room, commonly seen in Landal capital and unique to the capital, is clear evidence that Mesmer was once associated with the Golden Order, during a golden age of the capital, before he committed major crimes and was exiled along with his Land of Shadow, a place that now floats somewhere above the lands between, hidden within the clouds. And what about the symbol in Queen Marika's bedroom? You can also see it in Morgoth's boss room or in Faramazula. A flower in the middle looks very much like a daisy, surrounded by six-petaled flowers. If you visit Queen Marika's church, you'll see images of these golden daisy flowers, with other six-petaled flowers surrounding them, growing right beneath the statues of Queen Marika. 
Though this may not directly relate to Mesmer, I believe that when Queen Marika was alive, these golden daisy flowers were her favorites. Quite interesting, isn't it? All my analyses and hypotheses are based on observations from the trailer and the original game, and most of them are my own. You won't find these analyses in any other videos worldwide. And perhaps, after the DLC is released, all my hypotheses and analyses will become jokes. However, that's not now. Whether right or wrong, I just want to present my analyses and hypotheses and send them to you as purely entertaining videos. I apologize for using an AI voice because I have no ability to pronounce English correctly. If you find it interesting and don't mind the AI voice, please subscribe, like, or share it with your friends. I also hope you'll leave generous comments below to motivate me to continue researching and producing higher quality videos in the future, or feel free to passionately discuss your own hypotheses. Your feedback may help me answer questions about the DLC hypotheses at this current time. And now, to continue this video, it would be remiss of me not to mention an image that From Software has provided us with. You can clearly see a symbol that I'm quite certain is used to elucidate Mesmer's logo or provide more information about this character. Looking at this symbol, it's evident that Mesmer seems to have two snakes on his body instead of a snake with two heads on each end of its tail. I've already analyzed the imagery of the snake and its dragon wings in the previous part of this video, so what about the omen symbol? Why do I say this symbol belongs to the omen? If you pay close attention, you'll easily notice on the body of this symbol the presence of streaks indicating horns. Furthermore, in another scene of the trailer, we saw the advertising friend fighting monsters that I tentatively call summoner mages, and it seems like the setting of this segment could be located right below the trunk or a root section of the dying giant tree I call the crucible tree, in front of the entrance to a certain boss room. Pay attention to the gate in the distance, it has appeared numerous times in the original game. Now, look at the hats worn by these summoner mages, it's highly likely that the omen symbol is a stylized image of the helmets they wear. Even if the omen symbol is not directly related to these helmets, the close association between this symbol and the omen is hard to deny. But why do I call the monsters in this scene summoner mages? Simply because they have two items on their bodies related to summoning abilities in Elden Ring, one is the bell they wear around their necks, and the other is the candlestick they carry in their hands. As we know, the bell is an item capable of summoning spirits, which is well known, with a prime example being the bell Runny gave us at the beginning of Elden Ring. Another well-known item shaped like a bell with a candlestick for a handle is the wraith calling bell, with the following note, bell used by worshippers of revenants. Ring bell, using FP, to summon prowling wraiths. This can be done multiple times in a row. Wraiths are said to be the vengeful spirits of those who died when cursed. Reading these notes, it's evident that candlesticks and bells are items capable of summoning the spirits of the dead. So, who else could the summoner mages be summoning if not the omen? I believe these summoner mages are followers of a certain sect that worships the omen and are here to perform a ceremony related to the souls of the omen or the misbegotten. Although they have omen horns on their heads, it doesn't necessarily mean they are omen themselves. I think the horns on their heads are part of the hats they wear, and perhaps, after the DLC is released, we'll see many gamers wearing these hats after looting them from these enemies. It's also worth noting that the candlestick they hold in their hands is a very important item because its imagery is associated with a symbol on the small shield used by Mesmer's knights which we can clearly see on a previous image provided by From Software. But before discussing the candlestick and this symbol, let's focus on the small tree growing right beneath the dying giant tree. As I mentioned earlier, from the trailer and the key arts provided by From Software, it seems that the tree resin is pouring down onto the heads of three different entities. One is pouring down onto the crescent-shaped tower or onto the courtyard of the castle beneath that tower. The second is pouring down onto Mesmer's head in another key art that I mentioned earlier in this video. And finally, it's pouring directly onto the ground below its roots, where a sapling is thriving. Regarding the tree resin pouring down like a waterfall at these different locations, I explain it as follows. It's likely due to different camera angles providing us with different answers, 
sometimes giving us the impression that the tree resin is pouring down onto the castle below, and other times onto a different location, some distance away from the castle. But they all have one thing in common, they're all related to Mesmer. First, I'm quite certain that Mesmer resides in the castle with the crescent-shaped tower, because it seems to be the largest castle we see in the Land of Shadow. Moreover, in another scene of the video, we also saw the advertising friend bombing soldiers who are likely Mesmer's troops, and this segment also indicates that this location is very close to the castle. In another key art provided by From Software, we can also see Mesmer's banners appearing very close to this castle, or even corpses impaled on spears in another key art, you can easily notice this if you pay close attention. Second, in the key art describing the image of tree resin pouring down onto Mesmer's head, it's highly possible that From Software wants to suggest that Mesmer is harvesting resin from the crucible tree, and I believe there's a very high chance that this is true. So what is his purpose? When he threatens to bring death to anyone who loses the grace of gold? Personally, I think he may have realized the presence of Maquella in the form of a soul in the Land of Shadow because Maquella had divested himself of his flesh, his strength, his lineage. Of all things golden. Furthermore, as I mentioned earlier, the Crucible Tree Resin may very well have the ability to mutate the bodies of individuals who come into contact with it or mutate their offspring, creating a fierce misbegotten species, or even creating the Omen themselves, true war machines. Beings that humans living under the age of the Erd Tree believe that them carry the curse of the Crucible. To delve deeper into the analysis of this sapling, I'll temporarily divide it into two scenarios. Scenario 1 is that this sapling is an artificial product, and Scenario 2 is that this sapling is a natural tree, growing spontaneously from the resin of the Crucible Tree dripping down below. In Scenario 1, we are familiar with the Halid Tree, a famous tree in the original game, created by Miquela herself. Although it was one of Miquela's desperate attempts to create the Halid tree, to cure his sister Malnia of the Scarlet Rock curse. However, the most notable aspect is that the Halid tree, beyond providing shelter and sustenance for refugees and the weak in the age of the Erd tree, also has another ability, healing and even dispelling curses from outer gods. The most obvious evidence is that Miquela created it to cure his sister Malenia's Scarlet Rot disease, and Miquela's cocoon was also extracted from the trunk of the Halig tree. Therefore, it's not unreasonable to assume that Miquela created the sapling right below the crucible tree with the purpose of creating a method capable of healing curses for himself and his sister Malnia, or even entirely erasing the curses of the omen or the misbegotten. Of course, this includes the effort to revive his friend Godwin based on the summoning magic and the effect of the crucible tree resin, which the Omen worshippers likely hold the key to. However, for Scenario 1 to be plausible, it would require the support of another hypothesis, that Mesmer and Miquela are actually the same person, with Mesmer's body, but Miquela's soul. Or at the very least, Mesmer is supportive of Miquela in the effort to create the sapling, and if you pay attention, it seems that the sapling is located in the courtyard of Mesmer's castle, below. But this would create a contradiction with the hypothesis that Mesmer and Miquela are hostile to each other, as evidenced by Mesmer declaring in the trailer, those stripped of the grace of gold shall all meet death, in the embrace of Mesmer's flame, clearly indicating he is targeting all tarnished, including Miquela, who has abandoned almost everything, including the grace of gold. However, everything is not as complex as I thought, why not return to the trailer itself? As the images provided in the trailer are likely the most recent and accurate depiction of the Land of Shadow rather than focusing too much on the key arts? Exactly, in the trailer, we don't see any saplings, nor do we see the stream of tree resin flowing down to a tower below. In summary, the relative position of the castle below the crucible tree in the trailer and the position of this castle in the key art seems to be different. So why did From Software present us with a key art featuring the sapling? What is the sapling actually? To answer this question, first, I believe that in the DLC version, we may not see this sapling, or we may only see it when we are close to the conclusion of the DLC story. Therefore, whether this sapling is an artificial product or natural is not as important as I thought, and it simply appears as a purpose for From Software to create confusion in the public, to create more vague questions for us to comfortably search for answers, 
or they have provided us with a very clear hint. If you've watched the entire trailer, you'll witness McQuella's official appearance in the final seconds of the trailer. You should know that McQuella's appearance in this segment is hugely significant because it may provide us with answers to McQuella's purpose in coming to the Land of Shadow. First, we see McQuella's arm reaching forward as if touching a stream of substance resembling red and gold misty smoke, with a bit of flame ashes rising, indicating that McQuella is right below the crucible tree, and the streams of red and gold substance are likely effects emanating from the resin flowing down to the ground. In the next scene immediately after that, we see a completely healed crucible tree, with no signs of resin flowing out, and at the same time, McQuella's hand is raised, emitting a series of golden lights as if he is casting an incantation to heal the crucible tree and make the wounds on the crucible tree, which were oozing resin, heal back completely. Of course, I completely exclude the possibility that this trailer segment belongs to the past, before the crucible tree was damaged and oozed resin because simply McQuella just arrived not long ago. Therefore, we can easily see that one of McQuella's purposes in coming to the Land of Shadow is to heal this dying tree, and also remember that McQuella is the one who created the Halid Tree, an artifact capable of healing wounds such as those originating from the Scarlet Rot disease and erasing curses. In conclusion, the sapling we see in this key art is just likely a representative image, a symbolic image of McQuella herself. Thus, we have a key art depicting a stream of the crucible tree resin flowing down to Mesmer's head and another key art depicting this resin flowing down to the sapling's head, a young tree symbolizing Miquela, so it's hard to doubt that the conflict between Mesmer and Miquela will likely revolve around this crucible tree resin. But no matter what Miquela's purpose in coming to the Land of Shadow is, it seems that he has succeeded, although the price he paid was too high. The clearest evidence is that the director of the game, Miyazaki, has confirmed that the conclusion of this DLC will not change the ending of Elden Ring, meaning the Erdtree will still be burned, the Outer Gods will continue to influence the lands between, and Elden Ring will still be repaired. All of these endings depend entirely on the Tarnished, meaning us players, but it's also worth noting that Miquela is likely the one who asked Melina to give us the Torrent Mount and also asked Runny to give us the Spirit Calling Bell, all of which are extremely useful items on our adventure, so why did Miquela trust the Tarnished if they couldn't succeed? It's very likely that Miquela foresaw his own fate and that of the lands between, a situation similar to Doctor Strange foreseeing the possibility of defeating Thanos. Now, I think it's time to wrap up this video, because it's been quite long. In this video, I presented my hypotheses surrounding the character of Mesmer along with some analysis of Miquela and his purpose in setting foot in the Land of Shadow. Do you remember in the previous part of this video, I mentioned that I would analyze the symbol resembling a candlestick on Mesmer's night shield? I apologize for leaving that out, and it would be more appropriate for me to make a separate video on that topic. So, I'll conclude this video here. If you found it interesting, please subscribe, like, or share it with your friends, or leave a comment below to discuss more about new hypotheses. Thank you sincerely for watching my video. See you in the next ones.